I mentioned earlier, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end with a bit of an epilogue. Um, I haven't preached for how many weeks? One, two, three, four, five, six, long time. So if I'm a bit rusty, extend some grace to your pastor. Um, but I am looking forward to it. Um, <clears throat> as I was thinking about what to preach on, I, w- I read an article last Sunday in The Telegraph. Well, it was less of an article, more of a letter to their agony aunt or uncle or whoever it was. And um, it was a very interesting letter because the, the lady that wrote the letter said, I'm coming up to September's upon us. It's a new term. And I used to be excited uh, about the new term. It, there was something about a new beginnings that got me excited. But recently, I felt very anxious the past few years about September. In fact, this is set in, she said, in about July. Um, and I don't really want to start this new term. I'm very anxious, she said. And... Um, And I thought, that's very interesting. I thought, I wonder, how do I feel about September? And I think she has something in that. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to find out how we all feel about September? So I've uh, decided we're going to have a real-time poll. So we're going to put that on the screen. And uh, this is when you have permission to get your mobile phones out. Because there is a QR code when it comes up. There it is. If we're going to move that screen, there we go. We're going to join in and see whatever. This is anonymous, so get the QR code, or you can go to slider.com and you can use that number. And um, ask the question, how do you feel about September starting the new term? Are you excited and motivated? Uh, overwhelmed and anxious? Indifferent? There we go. It's coming in real time or other. Right, keep going. Let's go. What have we got so far? Well, wow, okay. None of you are feeling overwhelmed and anxious. Wow, interesting. Excited and motivated. Good. Okay, mixed feelings. Yeah, oh, that's coming up as well. Oh, overwhelmed, starting to make a. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. The people that were overwhelmed and anxious, they were overwhelmed and anxious about using the QR code. So that's why there's the delay, obviously. Uh, what have we got? 38% is still excited and motivated. Uh, keep going. This is fascinating, isn't it? How are we going? Oh, okay. Interesting. Mixed feelings is... Oh, okay, we've got some movement going on. 130 people so far. There's a few hundred people in this room. Um, <clears throat> probably about four or five hundred... Sorry? Uh, well, go to slider.com and you can add in the, cu- the number, which is 1773-449. Or just come over here and stand in front of the screen and do the QR snap there. I think we'll just spend 50% of my talk time doing this. How to get back gently into preaching. Don't preach. Okay. Keep going. Mixed feelings. Okay, I think this is probably a... Keep going, though, because as I preach, uh, we'll come back to this. But let's keep leaving it on the screen for now. Now, I think this is a fascinating uh, exercise. Um, Interesting, mixed feelings. I was reflecting on this, and I'll be honest with you, I have mixed feelings. I don't know what it is recently. I think, if I'm honest, ever since COVID, kind of got me out of whack from routine, do you know? And and I felt, actually, if I'm honest, I would be in the overwhelmed bucket. Completely honest. You know, there's the expectations, there's the pressures, there's the back into routine. Although I love routine, I think we create for order, by the way. Um, I think it's good to have routine. I do feel a bit overwhelmed. Um, and what was very interesting is the response that the agony aunt or un- agony uncle had to this lady's question. You see, she had some advice for this lady. And to sum it up, this was the last line of her advice. She said this, you're the boss, lay the law down. (laughs) Her advice was, listen, if you feel overwhelmed, remember, you're the boss and you lay the law down. And I thought, I'm not sure that's good advice. I mean, it feels like the worldly wisdom of it, there's something about it. You think, okay, that makes sense. Take control. And you're the boss. Don't feel like you're swayed by people, excuse me, people's expectations. You do what you need to do, and you, you create the law so that you can feel like you're in control. But the truth is, is even though there is something about that that sounds right, 
It's not what we read about in the Bible. In fact, the truth is, is we're not the boss <laughs> and there is another holy law that we follow. And I was thinking about how I respond to both for myself and indeed for those who have mixed feet. I'm glad you feel excited and motivated for you guys. You're going to be preaching next week, by the way. I'll do a poll later. Um, and I thought, how do we think about how we are to approach this new season? And I thought, well, what better book than to look at the book of Ecclesiastes? Thank you, Yasmin, my young adult's pastor over there. Um, now, some of you who have walked this walk and have read your Bible may have come across the book of Ecclesiastes. And um, what is typically the response of the book of Ecclesiastes is, isn't that quite a depressive and bleak book? Some of you are like, yes, it is. Some of you are saying no. And you know, I can see why one may jump to the conclusion that it's a bit bleak. Because the refrain throughout the book, which people often quote, is vanity. Everything is vanity. Or depending on your translation, meaningless. <clears throat> Everything is meaningless. In fact, it is used 38 times. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. But my heart for us this morning, church, is rather than this being a message of despair and despondency and bleakness and depression, uh, that we will see that there is wisdom in this. That rather than follow the advice of the agony aunt, that you're the boss and you lay the law down, that what we see in the book of Ecclesiastes is an altogether different approach, one that is designed to align ourselves with God's truth and to bring freedom. Who's up for some freedom? Yeah. My prayer for us is that we leave this place feeling free and join in the ranks of the 36%. We feel excited and motivated. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. It brings so much truth to us. In fact, this word brings freedom and liberty. Lord, we recognize that uh, we are bombarded with the narrative of the world, which is that we are to take control and to lay the law down. But Lord God, we find a different way in your word. I pray for each one of us this morning that you would open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. Lord God, that we would be open to your truth and that you, God, by your spirit would reveal the lies that we may have been living under. I pray in your precious name. Amen. Okay, so how are we gonna do this in one talk to go through the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, I like to set myself a challenge. So we're gonna start by taking a 30,000 foot view first of the book of Ecclesiastes so we can paint a picture of what it's about. And then we're gonna dive into some specifics of the themes. Is that all right? Right, well, the book of uh, Ecclesiastes is called one of the wisdom books. Um, and it's joined with Proverbs and Job. It's, it's found in that section of the Bible. And it opens with this line in verse one, the words of the preacher or words of the teacher, depending on your translation, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, the Hebrew word for preacher or teacher is koalet, which means one who gathers people together. In this case, therefore, the gathering that it talks about in verse one is to listen and to learn. So the word is often translated, therefore, as the teacher or preacher that gathers people to learn and to listen. And um, it goes on to state that the person is a son of David and king. And so, therefore, many have thought that this was written by King Solomon. Although, of course, the book, if you've read it, doesn't specifically attribute an author to it. But whoever wrote it, the key thing to realize is that the teacher, now listen to this, this is important, is a character in the book and is different from the author of the book. Now, what do I mean by that? The voice of the teacher is heard through the majority of the book, but it's actually a different voice than the author, which we also see. So at the start, the author introduces the teacher, and at the end, the author summarizes what the teacher has been talking to us about. You can see that in Ecclesiastes 12, 9 to 10. It'll be on the screen here in the room and online if you are watching us. It says, beside being wise, the preacher, this is the author, talking about the character in the book, 
also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. So there you see at the end, the author is summarizing the teacher's teachings. Why? To help us process what we just heard and a framework by which we can understand it. Are we all there with that? So <clears throat> what is the teacher wanting to teach us? We see in the book an overarching theme, and then we see related themes. Now, what I'm intending to do in the time that we have together is rather than give you a comprehensive guide, I want to give you a framework or an understanding of this book so that you can go away and read it for yourselves having this lens by which you can understand it because it is an amazing book. It is a liberating, freeing book. And the key theme, which is the, the, uh, the overarching theme, is this. Everything is vanity. Or depending on your translation, everything is meaningless. Now, to understand this point here, because often people will read that and go, well, that's depressing. Why on earth? I've had, I've had people say, and I've said this, why would that be in the Bible? Everything is, that's re like, really? But we need to understand what the word meaningless or vanity means, because when it comes to this part of the translation, those two words don't really do a very good job of translating uh, the actual Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is actually hevel, hevel, H-E-V-E-L, hevel. And it literally means vapor or smoke. Vapor or smoke, that's actually what hevel means. So the word, rather than saying that everything you do is motivated by vanity, or rather than saying that everything you do is devoid of any meaning, that is not what it is saying. It is not advocating a life where you go, well, nothing's of value, so I might as well just lay down and do nothing. That is not the message. Rather than saying everything is vanity and meaningless, what it is saying is that everything in life is temporary and fleeting. Everything in life is like a wisp of smoke that you cannot grasp or fix your world on. It has a meaning to say that everything in life is a bit of an enigma, a paradox. You can't grasp it. I mean, I remember we've got an open fire in the lounge and I used to enjoy seeing how roaring I could make it. So I would load it up with as much wood and fire lighters and coal just to try and get that balance, you know? There was one occasion where it wasn't a good balance. And rather quickly I realized that I had made a rather dangerous mistake and the room started filling up with black smoke. I was like, oh, this, this, should I get some water? Like what? So I went and opened up all the windows. And what I would have loved to have done is grabbed the smoke, carried it out and dumped it. But of course you can't because you try and grab it and well, it's smoke. And you see, that's an interesting picture of what the author is trying to say is, is that everything in life is visible, you can see it, you can smell it, you can, all those things, but try holding on to it, try building your life on it, try grabbing it, it's fleeting. And so that's what it is saying here. So if that is the, the essence of the word hevel, why is the teacher saying everything is hevel? Well, the overarching theme is designed to counteract the world's theme. Listen, this is God's truth. We need to understand we are in a spiritual battle. Amen? And this world, and what I mean by the word world is not the physical earth. It is the world's principalities and powers. It is the, um, the things that we battle against. The world would convey a very, very different theme. The world's theme is meaning and purpose comes from everything you do, everything you achieve, everything you acquire. That is ultimate meaning and purpose of life. I mean, that, that is it, right? Would you agree? You, the meaning, the thing you can hold on to, the thing that is of weight and of value is everything you do, everything you achieve, everything you acquire. You know, the devil's job is to convince you that what the, has ultimate meaning and value are the things you see around you and the time you now live in. Uh, that's kind of his raison d'etre.
Let's unpack this a bit further. I want to dig a bit deeper into this one. You know, we see around us a world full of wonder, don't we? Full of beauty. Full of potential for us to explore and create. And God wants us to enjoy our lives and his creation. But these things to enjoy and our achievements and exploits, listen, they are blessings from God so that we turn our hearts and praise towards God in honour of God and in humility towards God. I think I'm going to say that again. These things around us to enjoy, these things that we get to do and achieve, the exploits that we get to move in, there is much enjoyment in them, but they are blessings from God to turn our hearts and praises towards God in honour of God and in humility towards God. You see, what the devil wants you to do is ignore God at best and at worst think there is no God. Well, why? Because, well, you can be like God. There is no God. And, and suggest that ultimately what has value and true meaning are these gifts because there is no giver. You see how that works? I was uh, watching something recently of some social commentators who were commentating on our younger generation, of which we have many in the room, the sixth formers with us and slightly older, and they were saying this generation are hungry for meaning and for purpose. Hungry for meaning and for purpose. And deep down we all are. But there seems to be this particular pursuit and which is an amazing opportunity for the gospel message in this generation. And, the, and I think they are starting to discover that the lie that you can find meaning and purpose in the things of this world are going to leave you feeling a bit short. And you see, that's why the teacher is saying, listen, everything you do is hevel. It's vapor, it's smoke, it has no true meaning. It has no true value. And why does it seem to be such a very strong 38 times mentioned hevel, hevel, everything is hevel. Because the author is allowing the teacher to give us a reality check. And some of us need a reality check this morning and to be, if you like, electrocuted out of this narrative that we've heard that you should be pursuing value here on earth and the things that you accumulate and the things that you achieve are ultimately what is valuable. And God this morning is saying to you, and if you're here this morning or watching online, you're not here by accident. This message isn't for your neighbour, the one next to you or behind you. This is for you. He's saying those things are not of value. So let's continue. Let's look at theme two, which is related to this overarching theme of hevel, hevel, everything is hevel. And uh, the theme two is this, the pursuit of pleasure doesn't lead to fulfilment. That is another key theme uh, that is in the book. We're going to read some of that scripture in a moment because the world's theme is pleasure, pleasure. Let's get more pleasure. We have a whole generation who is fed on a diet of Insta Reels and Snaps advocating a life of pleasure. Is that not true? I mean, that has become the influencer lifestyle and I have nothing against influencers, but you need to see past it and see that the influencer lifestyles, especially these people, that's amazing. They get to go traveling and, and they get these free five-star hotel visits because they have a following on Insta. But really what's happening is that it is peddling a narrative which is you need to be living this kind of life. That you need to seek this pleasure and somehow if you are not, your life is less than. And we wonder why mental health issues is on the rise as it is. The message and the narrative of the world is that in the place of pleasure, you can find meaning and fulfillment. Well, I want to say that's hevel, hevel, pleasure is hevel. Let's read Ecclesiastes together. Why don't we get into some of this good scripture? Uh, we're going to read it from chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 to 11. Um, let's see what he says. <clears throat> this is the preacher, the teacher, talking about it. He said, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. You see... 
what's happening here is the teacher's trying to use wisdom to, to come up with the conclusion of what is, has meaning. And so, so he's now looking at the world of pleasure and saying, okay, let's see if we can find meaning in pleasure. So he says this, let's enjoy yourself. But behold, this was also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. Anybody try to do that? Don't put your hands up. My heart still guided me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made myself gardens and parks. I don't think any of us done that recently. Planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I brought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I mean, this guy's really going for it. I got singers, both men and women and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep them. Whatever I saw on Insta, I decided I shall do also. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered, this is it, listen. Then he took a step back and said, okay, I've done all that. How did that go for you? Well, then I considered all that my hands had done and all the toil I had expanded in doing it. And behold, all was vanity. All was heavy. And a striving after the wind. Anyone tried to strive after the wind recently? You won't catch it. Who heard the wind last night and the rain? And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Under the sun means this world, this life here. He said, listen, I've done it all. And I I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but I don't think any of us in this room have done what he's done. I mean, certainly I hope so. On a number of counts. (laughs) But he has pursued a life of pleasure and the conclusion was hevel. Meaningless, value, vapour, smoke. You know, um, there's two reasons for this. Ultimately, it doesn't give meaning or value or bring satisfaction. If you are chasing after pleasure, well, I'm gonna read to you Proverbs 12, 17 from the message translation. It says this, you're addicted to thrills? What an empty life. The pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. I think probably deep down we know that to be true because when you've acquired something, you need something more. You know, John D. Rockefeller, the first ever billionaire in the US, you know, from the uh, oil empire, he was asked once, how much money is enough? And he answered, just a little bit more. You will never be satisfied with pleasure. Does it mean that pleasure is something we should avoid? No. Pleasure is a gift of God. It is a blessing in order that we worship him and praise him and live our lives in honor of him. But do not pursue pleasure. Theme number three is stop the striving and the toil. Here's another thing that we see in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's look at this quickly. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1, 3 to 11. I'm gonna read only some of this. What does man gain by the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a de- generation comes. But the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full, but the place where the streams flow, where they flow again, all things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing and the ear filled with hearing. And he goes on and on. Like, how would I summarize this? I would summarize it with this. Stop taking yourself so seriously. I mean, like, stop trying to make a name for yourself and thinking that what you do is so important. Did the pastor just say that? I think he's been very rude this morning. He goes away for a little bit and he comes back and he's very rude. He told me I wasn't in... Chill out, man. Relax. 
You know, uh, I was reading the Bible Project on their, uh, on their summary of Ecclesiastes, and I'm going to quote it verbatim because I think it does a really good job of summarizing this. It says, sure, we develop technology and entire nations rise and fall, but go climb a mountain and see if it cares. <laughs> the fat thing was there long before any of us, and it will remain there long after we're gone. A hundred years from now, no one will remember you or me or anything that we did, but that mountain will still be there. And the ocean will still be breaking on the beach. And the sun will still rise and set. Time will eventually erase you and me and all we cared about. I think it's a bit of a reality check. It's not to say the things that we do are unimportant. They have consequences. But you see, so often our motivation is to make a name for ourselves because our achievements feed into the value that we have of ourselves. And the writer's saying, that's Hevel. Meaningless. There's no value in that. What are you working for? What are you striving for? And I think this is an amazing correction. And some of you may be in this moment and say, Mark, you don't understand. I have been working hard for this thing. And I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to be successful and achieve things. That's why he's gifted us with amazing gifts and dreams and visions. But don't put your meaning and value in those things because it's heaven. Everything is hevel. Let us move on. I'm about to think about doing this in two parts. Unless you want to just forget about going home later and we can just stay here. Theme number four. No, number three. Life has seasons. Expect ups and downs. It is four. Great. Good, thank you. Number four, I did that on purpose to test if you were paying attention, you all passed, well done. <laughs> let's look at read, let's, Ecclesiastes 3, one to eight. Now I think probably if you were to quote something from Ecclesiastes, you'll remember this. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck out what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And he goes on and it goes on. What is he saying here? Two things I think that I think are encouraging. Number one, if you're in a dark place now, if you are in tears, it's not always going to be like that. There will be a time of dancing and joy. I want to encourage you with that news. But also I want to say, if your life is going great, don't build your life on that. What do I mean by that? There have been times in my life where things have been going great and somehow, I don't know how, start kind of, I don't know, talking to the Lord less. I seem to have less reason to do so. Life is good. I think I'm set. I think I've figured it out. I've managed to do that well and that well and that well. And I've constructed a good life. And you think things are going well and you start drifting slowly, not intentionally, but you know, you get busy with the good stuff. And you're loving the mountaintop. Now, all of a sudden, you realize that you're stepping into a valley and you didn't even know it was coming up. And you're like, whoa, I've just realized I haven't been speaking to the Lord recently. Anybody experienced that? You don't have to put your hand up. So what the writer's saying is, listen, there's going to be seasons in life. And uh, with our own family news recently, I've been very much reflecting on this truth. There will be a time for dancing and joy. But don't build your lives and don't build your meaning and your value on the good times or the bad times. Because it's like vapor. It's like smoke. Let's move on to theme number five. <clears throat> Death and judgment awaits us all. Oof. Mark, heavy, man. Yes, death and judgment awaits us all. How is that good news? Well... It says in Ecclesiastes 11.9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. 
Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. You know, death is the great equalizer. And God will judge all that we have done in this life, whether good or bad. Let's think about justice for a moment. Most people believe in right and wrong, and we have a sense of justice, don't we? And we come to the conclusion or the question, so why do bad things happen to good people all the time, and why do good things happen for bad people all the time? Have you ever had that kind of conversation with yourself? You look at your neighbor who avoids the tax man and cheats his way through life, and yet he's on holiday more than you are, and his car is newer and shinier than yours. And you think, how's that? Lord, I've been a good person. I am righteous in all my ways. He, he's not. And he's living a better life than me. How's that happening? Everything under the sun will be judged by God. You know, the reality of life, friends, is that it is constantly unpredictable and unstable. Or in the teacher's description, like chasing under the wind. I would suggest that if you watch and listen and read a hyper-faith gospel message, you are going to be permanently disappointed. I've got to be careful how I talk about this. I absolutely believe that in the here and the not yet of the kingdom, God said, Jesus said, the kingdom is upon us. We are, it is breaking in. That's why we see miracles sometimes, but not always, because we are in a battle. It's like the difference between D-Day and V-Day. D-Day has happened on the cross. The decisive victory was made, but V-Day won't come until he comes again and consummates his kingdom. We are in the here and the not yet. Okay? A hyper-faith message will tell you that as long as you have enough faith, you can do anything you want, that you will definitely be healed and that you will definitely get that which you name and claim it. The problem with a hyper-faith message is that you will be left disappointed and condemned that you don't have enough faith. Now, I'm not suggesting that faith is unimportant. It absolutely is. And we are called to pray for healing. Up until the final moments of Luke's life, we were praying for his healing and saying, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just speak to his body and say, be healed in Jesus' name. We just curse that cancer in the name of Jesus. Like, up until the moment, why? Because we have faith that God heals. But life, well, it's like a vapor, it's like a smoke. And death and judgment awaits us all. And God will judge. And I think this is helpful. Romans 8, 18, the Apostle Paul said, I consider that all our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. This life, guys, is fleeting. It is momentary. This is the test run to see what rewards you'll get in heaven and the job you'll be doing. I mean, the, the devil will tell you this is it. This is the, the moment. This is what's of value. It's not. What is more real is his kingdom and eternity with him than this. That, that is the counter-cultural message of the Bible. That's why it says in the Scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. Do you see the order of things there? Stop chasing the hevel, because it's meaningless. I hope you're hearing me here. I want to summarize and leave you with some good news, lest you feel despondent. How should we live our life then? What is the summary of the writer here in the book of Ecclesiastes? He said, well, given that everything is heaven, like how do I respond to this? Well, I think number one is going back to that agony aunt letter, you are not in control. You can't control your life. There's only one who's in control. And that goes back to the lie in the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? You can be like God. It's the same old lie repackaged up in different ways. And I would suggest to you that the sooner you realize that and come in humble adoration to your creator, it is the moment when you can start experiencing true freedom so that you don't have to control everything. 
Because you can't. I think that agony aunt's response is going to set that person up for failure. Because they will try and be the boss and try and control things. And the more they try and do that, the more they realize they can't control things and the more they feel anxious. That is just worldly wisdom right there. And the second thing is this. Measure, meaning and purpose is not found outside of God. Our rationalistic, materialistic world is pushing a narrative that says that meaning is found in what you see and what you feel and what you do. That is wrong. That is wrong. So how should we enjoy our life? Two things that the teacher summarizes as I wish to bring this plane into a landing, hopefully not bumpy. Number one is enjoy the simple pleasures. That is the conclusion that we find six times in this book. Every time he has a statement of seemingly despondency, he says, so you know what? There's a gift of God. And we read it six times, and he says in Ecclesiastes 2.24, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his work. The simple things, such as friendship, your family, a good meal, or a sunny day. God has created these things to bless us and to enjoy them. You and I cannot control the most important things in our lives. Nothing is guaranteed, and in some ways, can I suggest that's the beauty of life? And so when we adopt a posture of complete trust in God, it frees you and I from the bondage of the things being in control and having to strive to make something of ourselves and to strive for more pleasure and to strive for value in our achievement and to strive to acquire so that we feel like we've made something of our lives. When we stop doing those things which are hevel, we start looking at the world differently and see the blessings as blessings. I think in my life, I don't enjoy my life as much as I should do because whenever I get a blessing from the Lord, I'm always looking for the next blessing. But what if we looked around us now and said, you know what, Lord, if you didn't give me anything more, I would say thank you for the rest of my life. Can you imagine a life like that, how freeing that would be? Living a life where we didn't pursue value in things. So do we praise him for the simple things? Or are we so focused on heaven that we are robbed of the now. And that is the message of Ecclesiastes. Enjoy life. Don't put so much meaning and value in the things of this world that you become in bondage to it. Who knows that if you don't, anything you worship other than God, you'll become in bondage to. It's a reality. And the second thing, and this is the overarching summary, is this, live in the fear of God. And with this, I'd invite the, um, Tiago up to play. He says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, the end of the matter. The end of the matter. This is it. I've, I've, I've given you the things that are vanity, the things that you think have meaning in. These are the things that are heaven. And so this is the end of the matter. In conclusion, after all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You want a life of meaning? You want a life of fulfillment? You want a life of freedom from anxiety that you have to be in control? Do you want a life that you enjoy the blessings of God? Then fear God. That doesn't mean have terror of Him because you're so scared you wanna run away. It means to have so much awe of who He is and His love for you that you run into His arms. That is what the fear of the Lord is. It means to recognize that we are set apart for Him. That is holiness that we are consecrated for Him in worship to Him. You know, it says in the Scriptures that the root of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. I preached on the fear of the Lord earlier this year. There is so much blessing in the fear of the Lord because it aligns us with who He is and who we are in Him. And when we do that, we experience His peace, His joy, His blessings, and we can walk through life with a joy in spite of our circumstances. I'd like to just end with this testimony of my nephew, Luke. You know, throughout his journey of frequent visits to the hospital, um, of chemo, of radiotherapy, of, of, of all those things, he had a joy about him, a smile about him. And 
there was an occasion where he was at the hospital and, and Sam, his mother, was with him. And they got the latest news a year ago and it wasn't good news. And um, he was waiting for the results. And he said to Sam, so... Uh, and Sam became a bit teary and he said, Mummy, don't worry. I'm going to be with Jesus. Don't be sad. You'll, you'll live your life and think of me and be happy and then you'll see me again. This is a nine-year-old boy. What was his testimony? What did he live his life? Exactly the same conclusion as the writer of Ecclesiastes. What's the most important thing? What's the most valuable thing? It's that we are His and He loves us and will be with Him for eternity. That's the thing of that. That's the thing to build our life. That's the thing that gives us joy in difficulty. That's the thing that gives us peace in challenges. My heart for you as your pastor is this. Don't conform to the narrative of the world that meaning is found in the things you do, the things you acquire, the things you achieve. It's a lie of the enemy. I'd like us all to stand as we end.